Sheriff Gulf covering. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live Thursday, February the 16th, 2017. Very powerful message this evening, looking at the prophetic stage that has been set by uh, these two world leaders right here. That is uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel and that of President Donald Trump, uh, the newly elected president of the United States. In this very meeting here that occurred on February 15th has set the prophetic stage, something that I, I highly doubt either leader ev even realizes at just how serious the stakes are in the words that were stated in, in this meeting that happened in Washington, D.C. We're going to be speaking about this here in just a few moments here. And before I get into that, I want to first remind you, our viewers there that are listening in, we will be in Israel on March the 28th. Uh, next month, speaking at a very special meeting there, uh, right there uh, in the old city uh, or near the old city. We actually, we, we have two possible venues. We've not disclosed the location as of yet. Myself, Kellen Davison, and a host of other speakers will be there. It will be a very dynamic uh, meeting there. It'll be inter, uh, uh, I say interfaith. It'll be both Jewish speakers as well as uh, those of us that are believers in Yeshua speaking. Um, it'll be in the afternoon. It'll be an open uh, house event there. We do have limited seating, uh, but we do need your help in making this possible. Uh, we will be recording this event to be able to share with you around the world. We may even run some of this live uh, on live stream. So you'll want to get, uh, get on Israeli News Live on live stream and cover this. And what you're going to hear tonight is part of the type of information that will be coming out at that meeting. It is a meeting, meeting myself where I will be sharing with our Jewish brothers and sisters that are there dealing more along the lines of those things that are happening prophetically around Israel, things that they're not aware of that is happening prophetically that is shaping the future and the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah himself. And it is something that I believe will shake and open their eyes. Last time I was there a few months ago, I shared with with several Orthodox uh, rabbis there, it really began to open their eyes. They wanted to know more. I've got rabbis right now waiting for me to phone them and discuss with them about this meeting that are intending on being there. They want to know how biblical prophecy is playing out and how it is affecting them, especially that of Rome's involvement, uh, which is major in these final days. And the thing that happened here uh, with President Trump and President Netanyahu and the words they said when I read the transcript is going to alarm you. Uh, it may seem on the outside like a good thing, but indeed it's not a good thing. But again, I don't think either leader really realizes the seriousness of the implications prophetically of what they were speaking about. I think that they mean to do well, but you have no idea, you will in a moment, of just how profound that was. So anyway, if you would like to support the meeting that we're doing on March 28, 2017, or if you'd like to be there supporting it, go to IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate there. Our address will be at the end of the broadcast. Or if you would like to participate in this meeting, email me, StephenBenoon at gmail.com. Again, that's Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, Benun, B-E-N-N-U-N at gmail.com. Let's get right into this broadcast. Very powerful prophetic segment here uh, and, and very disturbing as well. Uh, as we see the two leaders met, he also met with Vice President um, uh, Pence as well. He, he shared that on his Twitter page here. Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu did, said he had an excellent meeting there. And again, I want to do, I do want to say, I do support the fact and appreciate the fact that President Trump and that of Vice President Pence, that they do have a close and strong relationship with Israel and love the Israeli people. It's something we've not seen in a long time. Uh, but as we saw in the meeting uh, that was brought up here, the idea of a two-state solution began to take a back burner. But it's a new idea that they're coming out with, not just a two-state solution, but a one-state, but involving many other nations. Now, the thing is, though, this is what people are missing, though. They don't realize what those other nations are. It sounds from the outset, when we listen to this dialogue that I'm going to share with you here in just a moment, that what was going on 
is that there that it would be maybe some of the Christian nations such as the United States or Canada or other nations would be coming together to help forge a, a, a uh, forge a stronger Israel and and protect Israel from her enemies and things of this nature but you're going to find out it has nothing to do with that in fact it's been in the works all along I did serious research to find out and yes there were other nations involved let's first take a look at some of the comments here and then we'll start setting the stage with what's actually going on here I want to take you here and on your screen and behind me here this is where uh, from the transcript that I copied part of it Benjamin Netanyahu makes a statement here he says will the Chinese uh, excuse me well the Chinese are called Chinese because they come from China the Japanese are called Japanese because they come from Japan well Jews are called Jews because they come from Judea. This is our ancestral homeland, not foreign colonists in Judea. All right, now, uh, let me just clarify one thing. I know that there is a lot of our brothers and sisters out there that dispute the idea that the Jews that are in the land today are actually Jews, but you gotta remember, he specifies one thing here. We are Jews because we because they come from Judea. That don't, that's only three tribes, friends. That's, that is Benjamin, Levites, and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, house of Judah as well. These are the three tribes that are, that are there according to biblical prophecy that promised they would be in Zechariah 12. We'll be going into that in just a moment. There is a lot of dispute, though. I see all kinds of comments coming in from good people, people that mean well, no doubt. You know, we have a lot of black friends that believe that they are the, 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 the Jewish people that were driven out of the land, etc. And there are a lot of black Jews. There's no doubt about that. God said we would be driven to every corner of the earth, but we also said we would be brought back. Remember the promise to Abraham that he would be a father of what? Many nations. Now that does include Ishmael's children as well. It's not just the Jewish people, but even the Jewish people, if you look at this in a compound fulfillment of prophecy, have been scattered to all the world. So they have come back, and many nations have come back as what? The people of God. Why? Because it is the Jews scattered in among all the nations. And in fact, think about it. In every nation on the planet, there are a remnant of Jewish people today that are even DNA connected to the children of Israel that are living in the land today. That's something that you don't see very often. I got one very odd comment though. A man says, well, you know, it says, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. And they were liking the idea of what happened to a lot of the black people during the slavery days. And he's right. It's a very terrible and a very unfortunate act for the black people at that time. But you have to also remember how many people hung from trees during, the, uh, d during Hitler's Nazi uh, reign there, and even long before that? The Jewish people have been uh, cursed, and, and even many times uh, Jewish people uh, have stated, you know, we wish we were not the chosen people because of the fact of all the hatred towards them. I mean, my own family, my father's side uh, through the, through the uh, Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, Moroccan Jews went to Spain and then murdered because they were Jews. My mother's family murdered, thousands of them murdered in Europe. Even part of my father's family that had migrated to Europe as well, murdered as being Jews. Many times Jews just don't want to be Jews anymore because they've been hunted down, killed, persecuted, and murdered, and everything else because of who they are but they still have maintained that identity and have not forsaken who they are for the last 2,000 years since leaving the promised land. So anyway, when Prime Minister Netanyahu makes the statement here, we are Jews because we are from Judea, he was clearly identifying the land of Judea, even as what they say as the West Bank today, Judea and Samaria, kind of interesting, Samaria to the north, the house of Israel and Judea to the south, and that's where they get the names for Judea and Samaria when that, like so, such as for the example, the representative for Judea and Samaria happened to be Rabbi Yehuda Glick. That's why they call it Judea and Samaria. It is the entire section of what is uh, argued to be by uh, the Arabs that are Jordanians to be the West Bank. Now, going into this though, notice how he sets the stage right there. Let's take though and let's look at another statement as he makes in here. A little after a few seconds, he makes this statement as well. So he said, I want this to change. I want those two prerequisites 
uh, and this is the part you didn't see, I didn't put all the comment in here, but he's talking about what the prerequisites for peace would be. And Prime Minister Netanyahu makes clear that one, that Israelis will always maintain control of the security, and that's militarily, of the West Bank. Even if there was a two-state solution, as his point, we will have control of it. And as well, the Arabs that are living in there, as he says, the Palestinians would have to recognize that Israel is a Jewish state. All right. So he says, so he continues on. I want those two prerequisites of peace, substance, not labels. I want them reinstated. But if anyone believes that I am a prime minister of Israel, responsible for the security of my country, would blindly walk into a Palestinian terrorist state that seeks the destruction of my country, they're gravely mistaken. Now watch what he says here. The two prerequisites of peace recognition of the Jewish state and Israel's security needs west of the Jordan. They remain pertinent, which really goes back to the 1922 agreement after the Jordanians ended up getting the, all the land to the east of the Jordan River. Uh, so he's now kind of backing up to that. We have, took, we have to look for new ways, new ideas on how to reinstate and how to move peace forward. And I believe that the great opportunity for peace comes from a regional approach from involving our newfound Arab partners in the pursuit of a border peace and a peace uh, will, uh, will the Palestinians. Now, that's what he says here. Now watch what he says. And I greatly look forward to discussing this in detail with you, Mr. President, because I think if we work together, we have a shot. But notice Prime Minister Netanyahu's words there. Look at that carefully there. He said, believe that their great opportunity for peace comes from a regional approach from involving our newfound Arab partners. So this has nothing to do, other than the fact the United States would broker it, this is our newfound Arab partners. Now, I think where the whole idea of the newfound Arab partners comes from is because the Israelis worked with what? Qatar. Uh, Saudi Arabia, they worked with Turkey, they worked with all these nations in the fight against the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. Why? Because he's a Shiite leader. And so they came together and they forged a relationship that nobody really knew about because it was kept quiet in the news. And they began to work to try to overthrow uh, President Bashar al-Assad. This is where they were working together. This is what has really helped forge a stronger relationship between Israel and those neighbors that he has, the Saudis, uh, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Erdogan, uh, Egypt, including Egypt as well, right? Now, let's watch and see how Trump answers him. And this is what's so serious here, okay? Trump says, we have been discussing that, so they've already been talking about it, and it is something that is very different, hasn't been discussed before, and actually a much bigger deal, much more important deal in a sense. It would take, any, take in many, many countries and cover a very large territory. So I don't know, uh, you, I didn't, excuse me, he says, I didn't know you were going to be mentioning that, but that's now, uh, that, um, hang on, let me say, I got a little bit too big on the screen here. Let me back it up just a touch here. So, okay. I didn't know you were going to mention that, uh, but, uh, but so that you did, I think it's terrific thing. And I think we have some pretty good cooperation from people that in the past would never, ever have even thought about doing this. So we'll see how that works out. Okay. And then he says, Katie from, uh, he goes on to a person asking a question. So. This is setting the stage. There's going to be many nations, uh, all right, as, as he puts it there. Okay, it's going to be a bigger deal. You know, it kind of concerns me too, because I know there's so many people out there that are very concerned about the Rothschild idea, and that was the greater Israeli project, expanding the borders of Israel outside of that of uh, what we have today. Um, but it could still be considered the, the greater Israeli project, uh, the Rothschild ide ideology, but not in so much that it becomes Israeli land, but working with Arab partners in order to bring about a one state solution. Um, that's what it seems to be leaning towards. But let's, let's get into what this is. Where are we going with this? What is happening and how does this work out prophetically? Because we're going to look at that in just a moment. Before we do though, I think I need to share something with you that's very vital that a lot of people 
that, that was my concern with President Trump from the very, very beginning. And I'm not against President Trump. Like I said, I appreciate his stand with Israel, but it's the people that are advising President Trump that is concerning me. And I want to share some of this with you. All right. Now, those of you that remember this right here, uh, or know this man's face right here, this happens to be Kenneth Copeland in the background. Uh, this article here, Donald Trump's new evangelical advisor was sure God had chosen Ted Cruz to be president. Well, I guess uh, he was wrong on that, wasn't he, Kenneth Copeland? But then he had to get behind Donald Trump instead. But watch what it says here. Donald Trump's campaign on Tuesday announced that it had assembled a stable, uh, stable of religious advisors to help the presumptive GOP nominee get his message through to the evangelical voters. The list of names included former Republican Michelle Bachman, which, by the way, I'd received several emails from Michelle uh, a few months ago when I had done a uh, video speaking about her and how she prophetically uh, laid in, you know, uh, fulfilled a prophecy that, as far as what I could see, in her stand with Israel. That much like that of when Obama was going against uh, Israel, she was more like um, um, the, um, oh gosh, what was it? That was uh, Nabal's wife. Uh, that ended up marrying David, who stood up against her husband, Nabal, called him a fool, and Obama likened him to Nabal. Well, she got to where she didn't like that video, and she sent me an email. She, she was kind about it, but at the same token, I could tell what her issues were. I think the fear that she had was she had come from a church that very much identified the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist and didn't want to be associated with anything remotely like that. At that time, I began to wonder if she wasn't a, po a possible contender to be a, president, a vice presidential pick by Donald Trump uh, in that. But anyway, we did find out, though, that, of course, it, like this article here states, she was actually an advisor to him. So was James Dobson. James Dobson actually made comments on both the books I wrote, Israel, Are They Still God's People?, as well as Yom Suf, Israel's Final Exodus. You can look on the back of Yom Suf, and you'll see where he comments about both the books that I wrote in a very positive fashion there. Uh, we have uh, Jerry Falwell, etc. But when you get to the next paragraph here, Kenneth Copeland, who, along with his wife Gloria, are members of Trump's new advisory board. When I saw that, you know, the others, no, not, not as much of an issue there. Michelle Bachman, I know she's a major supporter of Israel, loves Israel, so does Dr. James Dobson. That didn't really bother me too bad. And I know Michelle Bachman, although she can't do it because of being a politician, she knows that the Vatican is not a good, uh, not, not the best place uh, in, on the planet Earth to begin with, though she has tried to distance herself from the church that she came from originally that taught that. Uh, but Kenneth Copeland, on the other hand, uh, charismatic uh, minister, really was the one that concerned me the most. And the reason why is because those of you that remember right here, Tony Palmer, who was the very uh, young man that brought the message from Pope Francis, Francis to Kenneth Copeland, that was to reunite all the evangelicals and bring them back into Mother Church. We were seeing biblical prophecy coming to pass with this major movement. And Pope Francis sent Kenneth Palm, uh, excuse me, Tony Palmer to Kenneth Copeland conference there when he had all of the big giant pastors that came down, as, as Tony Palmer called them, these are the big fish. They have jet planes and big private churches that, you know, with tens of thousands of members in them. And I began to see this was a uniting. The daughters of Rome were coming back to Mother Church. And Kenneth Copeland, who was the very main spearhead of bringing the churches back under the, the authority of the Vatican itself, was the very man now that was was now was this man here was the one that was responsible for, as they say here, uh, along with his wife, was the advisory board for President Trump. Now, keeping in mind, I'm not here to call anybody's Christianity into question. That's not my point here. But let's say, for example, let's say President Trump is a young Christian, and then he's being advised by someone that has joined right back into Rome and brought all the daughters home to the mother harlot. That's a major concern, because then what he's doing as well is he's advising the president as he works with Israel, not for Israel's interest, but for Rome's interest. Now, let's follow where this goes. Let's take that meeting that happened with President Trump 
and that of Prime Minister Netanyahu. And again, as I stated before, I don't think either one of these men really realized the seriousness of the prophetic impact of their uh, of what they are working on with this new peace initiative for a one state solution. Now I am a hundred percent, by the way, for a one state solution. I'm not for a two state solution whatsoever, but I believe in the equality rights for the Arabic people that are living in the land under one state, just like the United States has, or Great Britain has, you know, they have equality there and that's the way it needs to be. But this is a little different what's going on. And let's take a look, uh, as we get into this. Now I want to go here. Um, uh, this was the actual where I got the transcript from and uh, they, they did an analysis. I don't care about the analysis, but it's NPR that actually posted the transcript there and I'll leave that in the link below so you can see the transcript yourself. Uh, but this was the very article here that uh, really, really began to uh, make me think here. Uh, the New York Times, and I'm not a supporter of the New York Times, uh, but it brings up some very serious issues here. Because like I said, I began to do some research to find out if, if indeed, as Trump's words were, that they were working with their neighbors there. Um, and like I said, we got to bring this out right here. All right. He said, hasn't discussed before, and it's a, actually a much bigger deal, much more important deal. In a sense, it would take in many, many countries and would cover a very large territory. Okay, they're looking to do a one state solution. All right, so I decided to see, is this really going on? Is something like this actually happening and we're not aware of it? Because Trump also made the comment that they had already been discussing this, all right? All right, here is the New York Times, February the 9th, 2017. And there's more than one article, by the way, but this is just one that I use. Trump may turn to Arab allies for help with Israeli-Palestinian relationship, or relations. This is what the article states. And of course, this is one of the uh, settlements inside of what is called the West Bank. All right, but let's, let's it's a very long, lengthy article here. And I, I do encourage you to take the time to read all of this, but let's take a look at this, parts of it anyway. Mr. Netanyahu is due at the White House on Wednesday, has been talking about an outside in approach for a while. His theory is that inside out approach has failed. And so he argues if Israel can transform its relationship with Sunni Arab nations, they can ultimately lead the way toward a resolution with the Palestinians. A resolution, not a two state solution, but a resolution. All right. Now, by the way, if you read the article, you find out Trump says it's something altogether new, never been tried before. That's not true. The Bush administration also did a very similar approach a little uh, about 20 years ago. All right. Anyway, Jared Kushner, which happens to be uh, the vice president's uh, uh, son-in-law, uh, the senior White House advisor whom Mr. Trump has assigned a major role in negotiations has been intrigued by this logic. According to the people who have spoken with him, Mr. Kushner uh, has grown close to Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador and close confidant of Mr. Netanyahu. Mr. Trump and Mr. Kushner also had dinner at White House on Thursday night with Sheldon El uh, Adelson, the casino magnate who is key supporter of Mr. Netanyahu. A series of telephone conversations, personal meetings with Arab and regional leaders in recent weeks have also shaped Mr. Kushner's thinking and that of the president, Mr. Trump, has talked with President Adel Fattah el-Sisi of Egypt, okay, King Solomon of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the, uh, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. The President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey and Mr. Kushner has also met with Arab officials including Yosef Al uh, Otaiba, the ambassador from the United Arab Emirates. All right, now let me share with you something though that all these kind of guys have in common, something that you may not be aware of. All right, here we have right here, this is a, Egypt's uh, president, very close to the Pope, good ties with the Pope of Rome, right? All right, well, what about this? The King of Jordan, another very, you wanna talk about uh, King Abdullah II and his ties with the Pope of Rome, they are majorly deep, majorly deep, okay? We're gonna go into that in just a moment. All right, another one here. Now this here is the ambassador uh, to France for Saudi Arabia. Uh, I haven't actually seen a physical uh, photo with uh, the Pope of Rome and the King of Saudi Arabia as of yet, 
but they have still very close ties. I know that Pope Benedict went to Saudi Arabia and met uh, the king of Saudi Arabia before, so I know, again, they're very close. Why? They're Sunnis. The Vatican hates the Shiites, but they love the Sunnis. Okay, this is a big, 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 big issue right here. All right, here we have Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan Abu uh, 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 from Dubai. Again, the Pope of Rome. So keep in mind Erdogan with the Pope of Rome. And then, of course, the Pope of Rome with who else? Kenneth Copeland, Tony Palmer to your far right on the screen right there. Kenneth Copeland right there to the Pope's left on the screen, along with a bunch of other evangelical leaders, very well known evangelical leaders uh, in the United States. That was the big push to bring the, 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 all the churches back to Mother Rome there. All right. But as I stated, though, these Arab nations that are working with Israel on this new plan that doesn't necessarily include a two-state solution, all have very close ties to who? The Pope of Rome, the man that runs the show. Okay, so now let's take a look at this now. Let's move forward then and let's see a little bit more information. Now, when this was all going on, remember about moving the embassy there uh, to uh, Jerusalem and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu was talking about, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister Netanyahu was talking about building more settlements and Trump was like, the green light was on for all of it. Then something happens though. King Abdullah II of Jordan seems to have played a particularly pivotal role concerned that an embassy move would anger the many Palestinians living in his country. The king rushed to Washington without an invitation and gambled that he could see Mr. Trump. He visited first with Vice President Mike Pence, who had him over for breakfast at his official residence last week. Now, this, of course, this article here is, um, this was the 9th, okay? So that's, that's right, it was on the 9th um, of February here. Several days later, the king uh, 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 buttonholed Mr. Trump on the sidelines in the National Prayer Breakfast and made a similar case. He advised against a radical shift in American policy and emphasized the risk that Jordan would face if Israel were to become even more assertive about building settlements. According to the people who, who spoke with Mr. Kushner and Stephen K. Bannon, the chief White House strategist, by the way, Stephen Bannon and the Pope don't get along either. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work out, but they don't get along very well. Mr. Trump had already decided by that point to slow down the embassy move. A decision that did not especially trouble Mr. Netanyahu and his team, who while publicly supporting a move privately, urged caution to avoid a violent backlash. The administration had also received reports from American diplomats in Jordan that the threat level for a terrorist attack there had been raised at the highest level. Now, here's what's interesting. Take a look at this. There he is, King Abdullah, right there. He's sitting at the prayer breakfast. Isn't that odd? I mean, does that not seem odd? I mean, you're talking about a Sunni Muslim at a prayer breakfast in America, but it's not that odd if you begin to look at all the things that are going on, you know, like the Pope of Rome and, and his connections with the evangelical groups, and of course the Pope of Rome, right along with all the Arab leaders, including that of King Abdullah II, the closest relationship of all. He's accompanying him to the baptismal at Jordan, etc. He goes there before he goes into, uh, into Israel. In fact, he didn't go to Israel. He, he flew from King Abdullah, so he went straight into the, what is called the West Bank, uh, went uh, there, and then met with Mahmoud Abbas before meeting Prime Minister Netanyahu. It has been a sly underhand from the entire from the very beginning but the but the whole demographics are changing now now prime minister netanyahu has been galvanizing a stronger relationship with these arab leaders around his country there so now now let's take and let's look at this and let's begin to really break this down from uh from from a a, a bigger perspective i want to share with you on this right here this happened in october 2016 just to show you again how particularly strong the relationship is with that of king, the King of Jordan, Abdullah II, and that of the Vatican. Arab Christians integral to region king reiterates, His Majesty receives Apostolic Administrator Patriarch of Jerusalem. Notice that. 
All right, so we have the, 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 the patriarch of Jerusalem there. Uh, a, a looks, I believe he's a cardinal meeting there with uh, uh, Abdullah II there. And watch what he states here in this article. His Majesty King Abdullah on Wednesday received Pierre Bastille uh, Pisabala, who was appointed by Pope Francis as the ap apostolic administrator of the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. During the meeting, Al Husseinia, palace, the king said Arab Christians are a main component of the region, adding to its diversity. His majesty highlighted Arab Christians' role in contributions and safeguarding holy sites in Jerusalem, a royal court statement said. Very strong ties to the Arab world. Hmm, right? Now, let's begin to break this down. Let's begin to look at this from a biblical standpoint so that this might make a little bit more sense. Where are we at on the prophetic landscape with all this? Zechariah holds the key. And in Zechariah chapter 12, now I know there's other prophecies, no doubt, that may relate to this, but Zechariah chapter 12, and you'll see why in just a moment from the things I've already shared with you, how important Zechariah 12 is in all this. The burden of the word, word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundations of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. I have to tell you something. Brother Roddy Brown, very precious brother, friend of mine in Israel, who also has been working very diligently with us uh, on putting things together uh, for the conference here on March the 28th there. Brother Roddy had sent me an urgent messages uh, a few months ago, and he told me, Brother Steve, uh, Jerusalem, a cup of trembling is something on my heart. He says, I don't normally have these type things come on my heart, but I'm telling you something is up, and I just don't know what it is. All right, Brother Roddy, here it is. Here it is. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. They shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, here, here are some interesting things that I want to share with you um, that you may not understand. When you take the word in Hebrew that's for, for the roundabout, all right, we use roundabout on there. Of course, al is, a, is about, but the word round is uh, saviv. Saviv is literally just your neighbors. All right, just your neighbors. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. All right, now the word siege there in Hebrew, matzor, matzor doesn't necessarily mean um, that, they're, that they're laying a hold to try to take it. They're distressed over it. It's another way, it's a figuratively way to express the word matzor. Matzor is to be, they're, they're, they're stressed about what's happening. And especially when President Trump came in there and said, we're moving the embassy to Jerusalem and it's okay, nothing, you can build all the settlements you want. Well, he didn't say it exactly that way, but he was showing his enthusiasm for his support for Israel because I believe Trump really means he, he loves Israel. I don't think the man doesn't love Israel at all, you know, that he doesn't love Israel. The man loves Israel. But the thing is, is he's got some people trying to advise him in the background that they have a motive. And I don't know if President Trump realizes their motive. And their motive is to work with the Pope of Rome in order to get Jerusalem for the Pope of Rome. And the Pope of Rome is working with all these Arab leaders that you saw, the King of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and all these guys here to secure Jerusalem for him. As you saw, King Abdullah II saying in that article there that it was it's the Vatican that has safeguarded the holy sites of Jerusalem. So they are all distressed over Jerusalem. All right? Now, both against Judah, watch this, in siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Distressed against Judah and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, why? Because Jerusalem is that holy city. Why Judah? Why does it mention Judah? It's almost like Judah is singled out. All right, well, it, it should make perfect sense. What did Benjamin Netanyahu say? The Chinese are called Chinese because they come from China. The Japanese are called Japanese because they come from Japan. Jews are called Jews because we come from Judea. They're distressed over the fact that the people that are in the land today are Jews. And they have brought out more propaganda and more anti-Semitic articles have been written and more disinformation has been written about the Jews that are in the land today to get the 
Christians around the world to turn against them and say these are not the true Jews used to the main thing I always saw was that they would say well they can't be the, the, the true Jews because they're in their homeland and when they go to their homeland they're supposed to receive Yeshua to be their Messiah and therefore uh, they didn't receive Yeshua so they must be the wrong Jews well you know what if they're the wrong Jews you better get the right ones there quick because the Bible said that they would return to their homeland and that they would go to Zion they would be on Mount Zion there forevermore but then Micah says in chapter 4 that they will be in distress and they will have to leave Jerusalem Jerusalem because something's going to push them out hmm didn't know that right okay so if all right so and I and I'll say this in kindness if the black people really believe that only Jews that are, are the Jews that should be in Israel are the black people then God didn't get you there then God must have failed his promise but you know what there's a lot of black Jews there because they're Ethiopians and Ethiopians are, the, are are Jews because of the marriage by Moses and also that of what Solomon again the intermingling in in the races there you know and and God writes me a, a comment the other day and I'm like I couldn't I couldn't believe I saw this he says you know uh, black people are still black people even if they intermingle with white people what does that got to do with anything? But even when races intermingle, it does change the color of the other people. My great grandmother is a Creek Indian, nearly full blood. She is as black as most black people are. I'll share a picture. I'll, I'll put the picture up on my Facebook page just so you guys can see that. As dark as she is, and I got the fairest skin of them all. Most of my family are all olive complected. But I got my dad's mother's complexion, who had red hair and a very light complexion. Just jumped the generation was all. You know, I love all races of people, and Jews are from all races of people. And they're in their homeland, and this is why they're all distressed about it. And the Vatican has pushed more propaganda lies about the Jews that are there saying they're Khazars and everything, Khazars, whatever, whatever kind of nonsense they can come up with, they've come up with. You know? And they even say genetically the Palestinians by DNA are Jews as well. I don't doubt that they may not have Jewish blood, and I'm sure that's a good possibility. That's why I'm not against the Palestinian people either. Okay? Now, Let's look, let's jump back though. This is why we see they're distressed over this, over Judah and Jerusalem. Now watch this. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now this is, this is so important right here, friends. All right, and now we're gonna really begin to look at this. Notice, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though the, um, though the, uh, excuse me, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. All right? Now, that all that, all those people that is speaking about right here, this, this, all these people here, this is what, and I could have sworn I had it up here. I guess I took it down. This, the, all the people that are gathered together against it was what we saw in Paris, France on the 15th of January when 70 nations had come together to, to go against uh, Israel. This is that fulfillment there. This is also your Psalm 83 O God, keep thou not silence, hold not thy peace, and, and be not still. O God, for lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They hold crafty, uh, crafty converse against thy people, and take counsel against thy treasured ones, or hidden ones. Suponecha, right there on your screen, is the word for hidden. Your hidden. All right. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do they make a covenant, the tents of Edom, and the Ishmaelites, the Moab, the Hagarines, the Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the, and the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also is joined with them. And, and, and Syria was actually there at that meeting in France. Part of the 70 is actually 75 nations came against Israel. They are gathered together against them. But that's not the same as that 
ones that are round about that are distressed over Jerusalem and Judah. That's different. You see, that's a little different right there. All right, now watch this. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open up mine eyes upon the house of Judah and I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. All right. So we look here at the Jerusalem, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. And when we think about that, that, that Jerusalem is a cup of trembling. And of course, the word there in Hebrew that is used, saf, saf is the uh, word used there for cup. And that can either be a bowl or a cup and everything. And, and what is it in, in the sense that that's being used at is, uh, in, in my opinion, that this is something that has a lot to do with Obadiah's prophecy. If we look at Obadiah, it says right there, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. All right, that right there, the very words there that are being used there is called Clearly, sorry, I got something bothering my eye here. Uh, is clearly masculine plural, the uh, Tav Mem right there, showing that it was men only that were drinking upon the mountain. And I believe that Obadiah was speaking prophetically of when the Pope of Rome in 2014 came with a delegation of men only and the men that were there uh, here that had a communion service there in the upper room above King David's tomb. But if you notice in the next part of the verse, tamid, and the Gentiles will continually drink and it is what? Gender inclusive. Very interesting, isn't it? And that's exactly what happened. They continue to do communion services, not only in the upper room, but even in the tomb of David and threw all the Jews out. So what has Jerusalem become? It has become a cup of trembling to all the nations round about. In, in other words, a cup of distress, because what they're seeing that is happening there is distressing them. Uh, and of course, is distressing the Jews as well for these things to actually be happening as well. So I thought that was important there. But here's what I really want to get into with you guys that, that, can, that, that is really interesting when we begin to look at that, look at all this that's happening there. It says, In that day saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Now, what I find fascinating though is that if these things that that President Trump and and that of Prime Minister Netanyahu are doing right now working with the neighbors that are that are round about Judah and Jerusalem and these are people that are clearly distressed over what Trump and Netanyahu are trying to do that this this so-called peace initiative is being done from a distressed people, as we saw in the article. Let me find it again. Uh, this one right here. Abdullah comes to the United States. He is distressed over what Trump is doing, worried that he's going to cause a major problem. And what is it all about? Because of Judah and Jerusalem. So he comes to a prayer breakfast to meet President Trump. Tell me he doesn't have the inside connections. Here comes a Muslim guy in the middle of a breakfast. No wonder why he meets with, with the likes of uh, Pope Francis. It's no big deal for him to be involved with all these people. It's normal. And the Pope is involved with all of the neighbors of Israel, all the people that are round about uh, Jerusalem. And they're, they're, they are distressed over the events that Jerusalem is doing, that Judah is doing here. They're distressed that Prime Minister Netanyahu may do something that will prevent the Pope of Rome from gaining full control of Jerusalem so that they can, anything that might were to hinder or stop the rise of the Antichrist power that he intends to sit there in Jerusalem. And I have become more and more persuaded that it won't be so much the Pope himself sitting there, but he may very well bring in a foreign entity that they come through some kind, maybe through the CERN portal. I don't know. An alien. Who knows? The Pope's already said he's willing to baptize them. I mean, this is this things are getting nutty, friends. All right. Now, I share that with you to just to bring this out. This is setting the stage. Again, Trump, I don't believe he realizes what he's doing. But those people that are advising President Trump, Kenneth Copeland, his wife, other advisories, 
Michelle Bachman knows better, but you know, the thing is, is I don't know, maybe for political prestige, you kind of quieten down about the Pope of Rome. Maybe even change your opinions altogether. I don't know. I have no idea what these people are up to. Tony Palmer mysteriously dies in a motorcycle accident. Maybe the man had a good heart. Maybe he meant well. Maybe he realized that he didn't want to be a part of something that they were up to. Hmm. Hard to say, isn't it? But they're, they're, they're making these plans, and these Arab nations are distressed about the movements that are being made, and they're getting ready. Now, here's the thing, though. This is what is really odd. If we're seeing all this come to pass right now, we're also seeing the stage set for what? Let's go to verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Hmm. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, okay, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one who mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. By the way, the word pierced in Hebrew is a dakel. Dakel is literally not the word pierced like in your hands. It could be, but it's stabbed. It's like someone taking something and jabbing it into you. Figuratively in Hebrew, that same word dakel is like a, a, a major hunger pain because it's stabbing to the stomach, the pain when you're really majorly starving. Isn't it interesting though that Yeshua was what? Dakel. He was stabbed into his side by the Roman soldier. And what came out of him? Water and blood. The water separated from his blood. That was a clear sign to the children of Israel that he was indeed the rock that had been smitten. That Moses, on, his, on the first time at the beginning of the wilderness journey, about two weeks into the journey, when they're thirsting to death, and what did they say? You brought us out here in the wilderness to die? God says to Moses, take the elders of Israel with you. Go out. Smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. The children of Israel, the elders of Israel, came together, condemned Yeshua, had him put on a Roman cross there that he could be smitten by the Roman. Wasn't Moses reared up in the house of Pharaoh, believed to be an Egyptian, even though he was a Jew? Interesting, isn't it? See, the Roman represents the Egyptian. Represents like Moses, striking him. And when he struck that spear into his side, the water came out. The children of Israel were moaning and groaning. But let me tell you something. If they didn't drink that water, they were going to perish. And that was a type that the Spirit of Almighty God could be released from that human body so that it could come back upon you. All right? I know it's a little bit deep for a news broadcast, but I figured I'd throw it in there. But notice what happens. He pours out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. You notice it's all the family names. It has nothing to do with the tribal names because they don't know what tribe they belong to. All right? I mean, some might have it figured out, but David, the Levites, they say, okay, we're the Levites. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's really so, but nonetheless, the thing is, the house of Levi, the house of Judah, and the house of Benjamin have to be there because God said they were going home there. So if the Jews that are in Israel today are not the Jews, then God didn't keep his word, did he? That's why I make that argument for him. But the Vatican has been very diligent in trying to discredit them as being the real Jews. And every type of anti-Semitic garbage that has come out, and unfortunately, to the shame of many believers of Yeshua, that is, believers of Jesus, who have fallen for all this propaganda against the Jews. 
What are you going to do when their eyes come open and they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? Hang your head in shame? The house of the Levi apart, their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, that's Benjamin right there. David and Nathan are from the tribe of Judah. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart because there's been other families that have made it in as well. The prophecy is not short. It's not slack. Friends, listen, March 28th, we're going to be there. On the, on the Jewish calendar, that's, that's uh, Nisan, the first of Nisan. We're hoping to plant some seeds. You know, Paul said, one plants, another waters. Maybe his witnesses will be the one that come and pour the waters upon them. But we're going to try to plant some seeds because we have an Orthodox community wanting to know about these prophetic insights that I'm sharing with you now. This is just one of many. We need you to be a part of that. We need your help in making this happen. We're very, very fall, have fallen short of what will take to pull this off. If you feel led of God in your heart to be a part of that, please do so. IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com And we thank you for being a part of that. And I will be doing some very serious messages about these things, sharing with you some of the insights that I will share with our brothers and sisters there. There is limited seating. If you are wanting to come, I have been getting messages. Email me. Let me know. We're setting up a website specifically for the meeting as well. And once we have everything confirmed on the location, we already have two possibilities there. Um, they're, they're, one is already guaranteed. We just have to make the final decision there. We will update you with that information and give you the website where you can register as well. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.